that the recording Thank started here. Thank you very much. Um, and I think we better do the sederant again and then I will take my leave. Chair, uh, Councillor Blackett. Yeah, I'm here. Councillor Brown. I'm here. Councillor Toby. Yeah, I'm here. Councillor Goodall. I'm here. Councillor Cloffert. Here. Councillor Petrie. Here. And Councillor Ross. Good afternoon. Thank you. Is Jeeva gone? Yes, she has. Over to you. Oh, well. <laughs> I'm glad someone said. Um, okay, right. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we'll uh, crack on. We've got a lot to do and not a lot of time to do it in. So, now, item six on our agenda. We've got uh, application 2023 stroke 0190 conservation area consent for demolition of fire damaged building retrospective at Mar Braemar Lodge Hotel, 6 Clenshe Road, Braemar. There's a request to speak by a Bruce Luffman, an, an objector. Um, does the committee agree to hear this person speaking? I'll take silence as an affirmative. Good, thank you. Can I confirm that the speaker is on the call? Yes, he's on the call, Chair. Thank you. Can I advise the speaker? The committee will first hear from the planning officer and then you'll be invited to address the committee. In line with the guidance you have received, please mute your microphone when not speaking, if your phone permits this. You can unmute using the code star 6 when required. Please do not speak unless I invite you to do so, and please do not interrupt other speakers. You'll be given up to five minutes to speak. After that, members may ask questions. You will then be entitled to remain in the meeting for the rest of the item, although your microphone must be muted. Can I ask Neil Mayer, Senior Planner, to present the report, please? And to you, yeah. Neil. Thanks, Chair. Um, this one's before committee today because it's an application being recommended for approval, but um, as a departure from the development plan. And we'll run through the slides here, Chair. You've all had a read of the report, I'm sure. So it relates to um, the Bramar Lodge Hotel. You can see the site's location there. Um, in, within the settlement. This is the building back in its heyday, um, operated as a hotel for, for many, many years. And sadly, this is the state following a fire um, early in 2023. Um, so these are images from the time. You can see gables and stonework still standing. Um, a lot of rubble and obviously a lot of devastation there. Um, sadly, however, following that, um, there was involvement from from the council and building standards and whatnot, and and there was discussions between those parties about what to do to make the site safe. Um, but unfortunately, um, the building was removed in its entirety, um, and that's the retrospective nature of the application that we have um, before us. Really, the building's gone. Um, it's no longer listed um, since its demolition. Um, the the property owner, the site owner rather, has gone through the process with Historic Environment Scotland to remove the C listing because there is now no property there. But we still find ourselves in a situation where there are retrospective planning matters to to address. Um, we've largely been robbed of the opportunity to consider what could have been done with with the structure and um, whether it was consolidated as a ruin or whether parts of it were. Um, suitable to be integrated in, into some sort of redevelopment of the site. Um, for lack of a better phrase, what's done is done, um, unfortunately. And we're in the situation now with this application for conservation area consent, which considers the loss of the building. Now, the policy wording um, has a presumption against 
um, the removal of a building that, that contributes to the, the quality and character of the conservation area. And as you saw in that original image, it, it was it was a nice building, traditional, and it was a hotel that had been long established in the settlement. Um, the presumption was against its its removal, but the unique set of circumstances here due to the significant damage, and, and there is the information that's come forward from the applicant um, that goes back over the <clears throat> the timeline and 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 their reasoning for for the um, actions that they took, and that has subsequently been accepted by the council's built heritage team. Um, so there's not a great deal more to say on the matter, chair. Um, we do have an application on the agenda following the site on which focuses more on how the site will be left, which includes. Um, the replacement of the fence that, that sits alongside the common boundary with this neighbouring property and as well as repairs to the to the wall at the front and um, partly retrospective in nature in that regard uh, and it also includes details relating to the drainage and, and the surfacing of, of the site but really we're here largely playing catch up um, with what's happened on the ground chair um, it's a sad situation of course um, and I suppose to get ahead of the curve in terms of certain, some of the things that might be at the forefront of members mind is that there is nothing within the power of the planning authority to force um, an application to come forward to, to, to reinstate or rebuild something on the site. Um, it, the hope is, of course, that since what happened happened and since the, the building was then removed, it's been quite a drawn out process to remove the listing and get to these points in time. The hope is with a bit of good faith that once these issues are resolved and and I guess there's a lawfulness to the status of the site if these applications are permitted that that then removes potential constraints and concerns that would allow some form of redevelopment to come forward in the near future um but that's all speculation really chair there's not as I say we can't we can't crystal ball or, or, or make anything happen in terms of what the future holds for this site. We're just really trying to remedy and rectify the unfortunate situation that we find ourselves in. So this one it is here. It is a departure from the policy because there's a presumption again against the, the loss of such buildings. But because of the unique set of circumstances that have unfolded here, um, we feel that the only real option is is to look at supporting this one as a departure chair. Thanks. Thank you, Neil. And yes, it's a very unfortunate set of circumstances. Members, do you have any questions for Neil? Councillor Brown. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Neil. Uh, I know you mentioned the word lawful to to bring lawfulness to the to the site. So I assume that currently it isn't. Um, I, I hadn't seen the dangerous building notice, and I wondered. What does it actually say? I don't know much about these. How are they issued? Where is it issued to? Um, you know, what what does it determine that needs to be done, or what? what I, I don't. I didn't see it as part of the plan. I just wanted some clarification on that. If possible. That's my first well, question. Yeah. No, I appreciate you asking questions one by one. It makes it far simpler to focus on 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 the points. Um, well, really, the initial investigations about the site safety and whatnot lay primarily with building standards, so it falls out with planning in that respect. So, it's uh, it's just 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 a lot of different things at play, basically. But it's not really the focus of of where we're at now. Okay, so look, I was going to follow on from that, and that's why I was asking what the content was and and you know what the compliance issues are because. Um, so there's an email as part of the content of information that we've got where the um, architect is saying, um, OK, I note the dangerous building notice refers to submitting a listed building consent application. So I was just trying to understand what, what was actually determined and how, you know, you know the action that was required because it sounds like it was in the dangerous building notice there was initially initially following the fire there was work there was discussion about how to make the site safe and what bits would be removed then everything was removed 
So that's a large part of the problem as to why we are where we are here. Mm. But I'm not so entirely sure what email you're referring to. OK, it's it's an email that's in the pack of content from um, CRGP Architects, and it's an email that Brian McFadson, if, sorry for the pronunciation there, which I think is the director of the architect, has written to um, colleagues and mentioned. This when is you say low. colleagues, is this an email that's gone straight to the councillors? No, it's gone to Victoria Grant. Um, which I think is. So it's part of the discussions with the environment team. OK, so the, the email is saying. <clears throat> I'm just just trying to understand. So like... Councillor Brown, if yeah. I could interrupt, please. Um, I know your question is uh, to yourself pertinent, but is it pertinent to this application? And if it is, could yeah. you explain why? OK, sorry, sorry, Chair. Yeah, it's pertinent to the application because I'm un, I'm I'm trying to understand the process of what's actually happened here. It, it, it sounds like the dangerous building notice was issued timely. I don't know, within a matter of days and the applicant was advised and it, it, they've evidenced that they knew that a consent was required so yes, you know absolutely. there's no there's no there's no question of ignorance i'm trying to clear that there's no question of ignorance in terms of the fact that they were advised it's clearly written to them so you know consent was required there's no doubt about that it was the, was the line of questioning i was just looking to clarify yeah i thought i thought that was clear the works the, the building was removed without authorization yeah okay the it was then it was then delisted and we've now got these applications to catch up i suppose i can not too distant comparisons i'm sure most of you'll recall is when protected trees were felled at the bankery lodge hotel in bankery um it it's it's a similar set of circumstances there clearly some things have happened but the information that's come through from the applicant has said that once they got in to do investigations uh their expert input said it needed to come down and and i suppose in terms of your referencing emails back and forth between victoria grant and our environment in our in our built heritage team and the applicants representatives what's gone back and forth and been discussed yeah that's great that's obviously part of the story but what really matters is the 7th of march response from victoria grant and the environment team which concludes that the reports and surveys which have been supplied as part of the application demonstrate that the, unauth that the unauthorized downtakings, so there's your acknowledgement, it was unauthorized downtakings which took place were essential due to the concerns of the stability of the remaining structure due to the extensive damage caused by the fire. Sufficient justifications being provided to ensure that built heritage are satisfied that the demolition of the building, although unfortunate, was necessary and they have no further comments to make on this application. So um, I, I would ask that we don't pour over what happened and what wrongdoings have been done. And yeah, we've kind of missed the opportunity to fully get the information to look at what could be saved. But the fact is that the information is effectively caught up with the actions. It's not the way things should happen. Absolutely not. Retrospective applications and this committee have expressed their view on that several times, their disappointment to see retrospective applications. And in this case, it's it's a significant retrospective situation we find ourselves in. But through the application, through these discussions with Built Heritage, through the delisting and the input from Historic Environments Scotland, all the information is there to show that the, the structural investigation from the applicant's team has shown that the building did need to come down. And this application effectively is acknowledging that and allowing the site to then, from a planning point of view, gain a lawful status. That removal happened prematurely before gaining consent, but we've gone through the process now and here is the consent to recognise that what's done is acceptable. OK, thank you. So do you need a building warrant to demolish a building? Has that has that been is that part of the process? We're Separate looking at planning. Things? That's building standards process. So you do, you do need one or but I'm that not, I'm not, not I'm not entirely sure. Um, I don't think so for interrupting again. 
Sorry for interrupting, Neil, but I don't think that is relevant to the our current uh, application. Uh, the building warrant is separate to planning, and uh, I don't think we should be discussing that here. Uh, are you quite happy with your? Do you have any more pertinent answers, Councillor uh, Brown? Yeah. Oh, sorry, questions. <laughs> We're all yeah. getting tired, so I'll be getting a bit tongue-tied soon. I know. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I mean, I just, I mean, I know what you're saying, Neil, but the, the, the accountability has not been addressed here. And I, I think um, that there obviously is a mechanism. I'm, I'm not sure if, if this is scooped up in plan. And I've asked about a building warrant and I've asked if there was obviously indication that the, the architect knew and they clearly did. Um, you know, that knew that the consent was required. And, and why I was asking that question is we've been asked to retrospectively give consent. And 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 actually, I'm, I'm just not understanding the justification. I'm trying to pin down in my head the justification for this um, and, and, and get comfortable with the fact that it seems to be a case of clear ignorance on, or, or not ignorance, but clear willful disregard, I guess. Um, and that that was where I was getting to. Um, yeah, I appreciate um, the the information in front of us indicates that there's been um, justification and, and information. And, and I've looked, um, I've just looked, I've, I've I've looked into the construction company um, Stanley Brash, and their their statement that's considered as part of the evidence here is is addressed to Brian. Um, McFadden, there's the, but it's titled to whom it may concern. It doesn't have a date on it, and it's it's a justification statement. Um, so you know, are you saying that it's it's that justification statement that Built Heritage team are happy to accept? There's more than one document. Everything's on the file. It's all it's all there, Councillor Brown. There's multiple. Let me just pull up the file. We have got the record of works, which is their chain of events. We've got a building assessment letter. We've got further supporting statements. There's obviously been, well, have been elements of discussion, but look, I appreciate fully the frustration with what's happening in the chain of events and so on, but the information's all on the file. It's been reviewed by the consultees. It's acceptable to the consultees. It's acceptable to the planning service. We can't, and, and, and it's no different to any other retrospective application, be it someone who deliberately or unknowingly extends their house. And we, we have the application before us. You assess what is before you, which is a file with all relevant information, which makes the consultees happy. If, if the information in the case and the justification and the, the structural survey information wasn't acceptable, you wouldn't have built heritage accepting this. Their remit is protecting the built environment in the historical setting. Um, I'm here before you with a planning recommendation to approve the application. I wouldn't be here recommending that if there was gaps in information or significant flaws. I mean, it, I think it's noted in some of the representations that the length of time it's taken to get to this point. And that is because there's been a lot of questions during the process to get to this point, a lot of scrutiny, a lot of things asked and asked again, and, and to make sure that we, as as Built Heritage, Historic Environment Scotland Planning Service, that we are satisfied. So I appreciate this. This is largely your first look at it as it's come to committee, but um, it's certainly not an issue that's been taken lightly. It, it's been incredibly thoroughly assessed and, and looked at by ourselves and by our Built Heritage colleagues. So everything's there on the file. I um, appreciate everyone will have their own views on, on the, the property owner's actions, um, but that's not what we're really here to debate today. We've, we've got to stick to the material planning considerations which are set out in the report before you. Thank you, Neil. Um, I I, I, sh I will reinforce what Neil has just said. We have to consider the material planning issues and nothing else. The, I'm sorry, but the past must be the past and we can't dig into that. Uh, and perhaps as a way of taking it forward in some other committee or in some other fashion, but I don't think that's within our remit. Um, have you finished with your questions, Sarah? It's fine for now. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Brown. Uh, Councillor Petrie. Thanks. Um, just a quick one, Neil, and it might actually be for the monitoring officer, but if we 
didn't consent to this application, what is the other option? Because it's been done. So it's before us to make a decision on, but what's the alternative to our decision saying we grant this? Yeah, this 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 becomes a problem. So currently, currently the demolitions unauthorized, and this this would this would regularize what's happened. Um, from a planning point of view, there's a positive recommendation in front of you, which suggests that whilst the chain of events and what's happened isn't the correct way to do things, we've reached the point where we're satisfied with the information that that justifies what has happened. With that information, it then makes pursuing enforcement action difficult and what would be what what would the enforcement action be because enforcement action yeah it's a discretionary power and it's acting in the public interest is there an overriding public interest i, I mean it it would not be a simple thing to ever pursue um that's not saying it's not something that could be pursued but i i, I would question the intent behind what could be reasonably done through enforcement powers. Um, it's difficult. As I mentioned, one of the one of the scenarios is a positive outcome here. It removes that unauthorized element and it may well free up the site for for redevelopment because there isn't this breach of planning control hanging over the site. It, it it's impossible to know really where it, it's it's crystal ball stuff again unfortunately are you happy with that answer councillor petri yeah um it was really just in terms of what the alternatives were because there's a decision before us but it's almost a non-decision in that there is no alternative to what we can really decide here there is but it's very complicated and you know, it, so yeah, it's fine. Thank you for that, Neil. I just wanted that clarified because I think it's important that we know what the alternative is, is if, if we were to go against the officer recommendations. Thank you, Councillor Petri. Uh, Councillor Ross. Thank you. And that was interesting. So basically, we are where we are um, with this. We cannot discuss the past with it. And my understanding, Neil, from what you've said, is that if this was refused, it would be a matter for enforcement to decide where to go from there, and it's nothing to do with us. What the, the steps enforcement would take are not within our remit. Correct. OK, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, any other questions from other members? No, thank you. I will now invite Bruce Luffman to address the meeting for a maximum of five minutes. Is Mr. Luffman on the telephone phone? I said it's so old fashioned when I said that telephone. <laughs> oh, that's my age. I'm over 41 now. Mr. Luffman? Mr. Luffman, I think your microphone might be on mute. If you could press unmute or dial star six, and that should hopefully unmute you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Hello? You can. Yes, Mr. Luffman, you have five minutes to uh, talk to the uh, committee. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, before I start, I would like to say that I'm using an acronym of HES, or Historic Environment Scotland, throughout the paper. This application, while seemingly fairly innocuous on the face of it, covers a litany of obfuscation, ineptitude, and deception. To put it bluntly at the outset, this application is an attempt to rectify and in some way to justify a criminal act, that is the demolition of a listed building without permission and within a conservation area. And it is certainly not the same as uh, adding a new uh, extension to a house. It's much more serious. The fire in March 22 at the historic Environment Scotland listed Braemar Lodge Hotel started in an adjacent shed and verified by the fire service and not in the kitchen as purported by the owners. The resultant explosion from gas canisters also damaged the neighbouring bungalow and the house owner has not been compensated. The hotel was destroyed by the fire but a considerable quantity of the granite building remained as can be seen by the photos in the report by the structural uh, engineers from David Naro. 
The site was visited on the 17th of March and a report and photographs produced. The committee have been shown the, the photographs, but not the report, which is online, which is critical, as are the emails from the council planning officers. They show two main things. One is that the planning office service only asks for the site to be made safe and an application could follow. And the other, that the engineer's report does not recommend demolition, but expresses concern about safety aspects of some of the building with some identified demolition. Much concern was made about the safety of the public, but only Harris fencing was put around the site and no partial demolition took place to render further safety until the complete demolition and clearance of the site took place four months later in mid-July in breach of any council or HES permission. This application paper's description glosses over the context and timing of the actions of both the planners, engineer, and the subsequent conduct of the applicant. This issue is clear. No supporting statement was submitted to HES or permissions given at any time by the planners or the demolition of this listed building, which is also compounded by being in a conservation area. The demolition was a criminal act, which went undiscovered by the council or CMPA planning services or HES until a notable personality noticed the cleared site and questions were asked. I find this incomprehensible, given that the CMPA and the council have planning enforcement officers and that neither planning service were monitoring this site. As the previous CMPA enforcement officer, this would have been the top of my list for continuous monitoring. The subsequent retrospective application was validated in February 2023, six months after the complete demolition, and it has sat undetermined until now, 18 months later. After almost a year, and clearly not willing to address the criminal act that had taken place, Hess delisted the non-existent building and basically washed their hands of the case. My objection, of which you have a copy, details why this was wrong, but I would also suggest sent the completely wrong message to the public that unscrupulous action to a listed building goes unpunished. This application, application highlights a farrago of missteps, poor decisions and follow-up, and culminating in the loss of an important building in Braemar. The council planners did not do anything wrong in their advice, but did not follow up that advice. The two enforcement services were remiss in their actions and Historic Scotland failed in their duty to protect the listed building environment. However, ever, we are where we are and this paper is seeking to paper over the cracks and move on. Is it not the duty of this committee to challenge the fact that a listed building was completely demolished without permission and the site cleared? I reiterate, this was a criminal act and therefore uh, enforcement can be taken if you were to turn this down. Therefore, I would ask for the committee to consider that if you're going to depart from policy of both the CMPA and the NPF4, then I would suggest that some way could be found to condition that approval by requiring an application within a set time period for an appropriate building to be constructed on the site. That would be an interesting one with the legal voice. Otherwise, I would respectively suggest that you are giving developers the green light to ravage and destroy any part of our listed built heritage because it is inconvenient or costly. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lofman. Do members have any questions for Mr. Lofman? I can't see any indicated questions. Just in case I'm missing something. No. Thank you. Mr. Luffman, do you feel that you've had a fair hearing and opportunity to present your case? Of course, you allowed me to do it, and I'm very grateful for that. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. Can I ask the planning officer if they'd like to make any comment on any issues raised in the request to speak? Neil? Thanks, Chair. Um, not really. I mean, again, 
Mr. Luffman's spoken about the facts surrounding the case um, and, and expressed his, his views surrounding the situation. And, and equally, when Councillor Brown's question, the, the frustration and almost disbelief as to the situation we're in is clear from all. Um, and, and I suppose one point of clarity, Chair, I'm absolutely not comparing this scenario to that of an authorised house extension in terms of the development. The comparison was in relation to having to separate the retrospective nature and look at the facts around the application in terms of the information before us that, that, that satisfies policies to a great degree and satisfies the consultees. Of course, we're speaking about a departure in this case, which is discussed through the report. But just to repeat, really, Chair, the Planning Service have absolutely not taken this lightly and criticisms of the enforcement function of both the park and and Aberdeenshire Council I feel is thoroughly unjustified. Um, we rely heavily on members of the public to be our eyes and ears and, and react appropriately when things are brought to our attention. It's highly unreasonable to expect that a vast geographical area of Aberdeenshire has people out monitoring and supervising every area. Um, it would just, just be a, an, an incredible cost and, and staffing resource. But anyway, um, the, uh, Councillor Luff, uh, former Councillor Luffman, I should have said, Bruce, Bruce, Mr. Luffman, um, outlined the length of time it's taken. I mentioned it myself earlier. It's been a struggle to get to this point, but we're now at the point where the key consultees are accepting of the situation that we are in, and that the loss of the building has retrospectively been been justified. The message that then sends elsewhere, I don't, I don't think it sets any sort of precedent. I hope we never face such a situation, but if we do, again, the same questions would be asked, the same steps would be made. Um, and, and again, if, if information came forward that justified what had been done, we would we would reach a point where the process catches up with the actions. Um, so again, just to repeat, you've got the recommendation from the report in front of you. Um, I suppose just, again, I think I did cover it earlier. But Mr. Luffman mentioned it about a request for a condition to require a, a planning application to do something with the site within a certain period. I'm afraid that's just not possible. It wouldn't be competent. It wouldn't meet the six tests of a of a competent planning condition. So that's not something we can do. You either uh, accept the recommendation that's in the report and that hopefully unlocks uh, this issue and, and frees the site up to be to be progressed in some way in the future. But we'd have no control over that. That, that's all, Chair. Thanks. Thank you, Neil. Uh, do members have any further questions for Neil now that you've heard uh, from him and the uh, objector? Any questions? Councillor Petrie. Thanks, Chair. Sorry. So just to be clear on that, if we refused what's before us just now and it went to enforcement, could that site, there could be nothing done with that site until that enforcement was followed through or there was an outcome to that enforcement? It, it's almost impossible to say, but you wouldn't expect, say, a third party to purchase a site and look to redevelop or, or reinstate something with an outstanding enforcement notice on it. That would put off any potential purchaser, one would think. But again, it's not really my place to comment on that. I, 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 just a planner. The issue would get past the enforcement they would do what they may do or rather i would more likely expect that any refusal would be appealed before any Is enforcement that... action would be would be pursued anyway thank you neil gwyneth are you happy with that any further questions i don't see any members do you have sufficient information to determine the application if no, what do you require and from whom? Is a site visit sought? And could you clarify if uh, what the site visits per, uh, would, be, would be for? Councillor Brown. Well, sorry, Chair, no, it wasn't for that. I was just going to move into discussion. Sorry, premature. Thank you. So, I take it from our uh, councillor Tarvey, you have your hand up. Yeah, just do not make the same mistake as the previous Ma committee. If we want the site visit, it has to be done before question and discussions. Yes. 
Anyone so, want one? I don't see any indication. Your hand's still not up, Ipe. So I take it from our silence that we are um, happy to continue uh, to determine the application. If members have sufficient information, we shall proceed to discussion and debate. Who wants to start the discussion? Councillor Brown. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, read everything associated with these applications and, and more. Um, and my starting point was obviously around did, did the applicant know, and, and it's quite clear that they did know um, as far back as March that, that, that permission and consent was required. Um, I, you know, I've got asked for clarification around the building warrant that was obviously required and, and wasn't requested either. And apart from the initial in, in structural engineers inspection by David Narrow, um, which, which mens mentions bracing windows and, you know, highlighting the chimney and stuff like that, there doesn't seem to be anything further. Um, there's no doubt in my mind that time lag is an issue. Um, the um, the construction company Stanley Brash had time, it appears, to um, register and um, apply for a um, waste carriers license, which was only issued in the May. Um, so that was that was issued on the 17th of May. So there was time for that to happen. They also mentioned in their justification statement, because that's not dated, um, they also mentioned that they tended for the work. So there was a time lag there as well. So not seeking consent um in my mind isn't down to time. Um and, and the you know the urgency to make the building safe. It was Harris fenced off and it was safe of sorts. Um Stanley Brash also mentioned um, their 40 years experience in their justification letter. Their website actually mentions 18 years experience, but um, their website also mentions they can call on architects and structural engineers, and they've obviously incredibly experienced. So there's no doubt that even the construction company were aware of their requirements and the legality. They've actually mentioned in their statement working on a, a fire damaged property um i think it was back in two it was quite a while ago i looked on that when that happened as well so you know it, it would seem incomprehensible that either the architect or the construction company were were not aware of the duty and um, the need for process um in such a situation with um a c-listed building as well um I actually found lots of press. This was before my time as an elected member. I found lots of press, including a, a, a the PNJ who were videoing the demolition um, who, uh, on the 4th of July. And they'd mentioned in, in the report that it would be a maximum of two weeks to, for the hotel to be fully knocked down. So um, there's there's no doubt of, in my mind, of the intention and, um, you know, the the, 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 the 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 information in front of us has gaps in as much as its justification of what happened. The statement, a uh, further statement in the pack actually highlights points that the um, person writing it wishes to emphasise, and that is just further justification. Now, um, I appreciate this is an unusual situation, and um, but I am. Uh, I think it's in the public interest and, and it's our duty to uphold the policy and law. And it's clear to me that there has been breaches significantly for which I've got no evidence to accept. So I'm moving um, that we do not, um, I propose that we do not accept the recommendations to grant. And I, I propose that we refuse on the basis of not um, departing from the policies that are mentioned. Thank you, Councillor Brown, but we're still in the discussion period. Um, we'll see if you can uh, bring forward your motion in a few minutes, I take it. Um, first of all, before I, I proceed, I missed a step. Um, our monitoring solicitor, Barbara, do you have any comments to make on the procedure so far or any uh, anything you want to highlight? Not especially. I just I think it's important just for members to focus on this paper that's in front of them just now and not the issues that led us to here because I think I feel the report's quite clear that the process was incorrectly followed but this is where we are today so I think if any you know motions or proposals can be framed around that rather than 
of what might have gone on in the past that would be useful because we're not that's all been in the report that the the past process has not been correct if Neil wants to step in here I'm more than happy to hear his opinion but I think that's what's being said here and um if members could just remember that when they're you know speaking or putting proposals or motions forward yeah thank, thank you Barbara. just sorry chair yeah just to kind of repeat I mean the, the strength and, and content of what Councillor Brown's saying it's it, very clear and, and it speaks volumes of the situation that we're in here but we have a planning application we have to make a planning decision and this, do, this does go back to the comparison about the general premise of a retrospective application whether it's a modest house extension or what that you can't take the actions of the applicant into account whether they knowingly or unknowingly did something you have to stick to the planning merits of what's before you and that in this case includes the resolution from our built heritage team who whose responsibility within the council basically is to protect our built environment they are satisfied with the information that has come forth during the course of this application that the removal of the building was justified um, in the event of any refusal that is what a reporter would look, look at they wouldn't look at where the fire started and whether the applicant did or didn't know and whether they did or didn't ignore a, a notice to consolidate two gables of the building or whatever the content of the notice was they will look at the situation now and what's before us now to make the decision and um, so just just to be mindful of that of course we know with any refusal that appeals may come and with any appeal there can be um an award of costs against the council um for example so it, it's it's just think think about the reasoning um, behind any refusal that you may move it, it can't be behavioral based it must be planning on planning merits thank you neil um councillor turvey you're muted i was going to yes yeah. yeah, sorry i was going to second councillor brown thank you um any other member seeking to discuss this topic Councillor Petrie. Yeah, th thanks, Chair. And more just a comment than anything else, because I think this is a really difficult one in that um, we know what the situation is and that it shouldn't have been done. But I think if we're looking at a way forward, we have to perhaps look at what the best way forward for this is in that the building can't be brought back now it's been demolished. I think it's unfortunate that it's been demolished. But we can't recreate that. So what's the best way forward? And is that that we allow, we grant this application before us and then it's within committee's power for any application that comes before us to make sure that what we see on that site is preferable? Or do we push it to enforcement because we, because what was done was wrong? And it's a really tough one. And I think I'm happy if other people want to come in to hear what they want to say because I'm not entirely sure how I would vote on this one yet because it is a really difficult one but I think my mind's going towards the practical bit issue here which is actually if we can just grant this accept that we're not happy with what's happened but grant it and then we retain that democratic control over what happens with the site going forward whereas if we put it to enforcement this drags on a lot longer and there's an empty site in the village which will just be left there until until this is um, resolved. And I think in terms of the village, maybe the the better option here is to move this forward in the, any way that we can. So not moving an amendment yet, but may do, because I think in my mind, that's the best way forward for, for this one. Thank you, Gwyneth. Councillor Ross. Thank you. And I would reiterate that I'm not happy that we are where we are, but we are where we are. And actually, I think that what Councillor Petri has said might be the way forward because we cannot it's a retro we cannot discuss anything retrospective that 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 i.e. that's happened. We have to consider what we've got in front of us today. And on that basis. I think that if Councillor Petrie was to move an amendment, I might support her. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ross. Uh, Councillor Cloppert. Yes, 
Thank you very much, Chair. And um, I just needed as well quite some time to think this through and listening to the discussion. Um, I was coming towards making actually an amendment and I didn't quite understand, uh, sorry, Chair, where, you know, what you meant is like, oh, well, we're getting close to a conclusion or not. So, um, um, Councillor Petrius uh, has very much worded um, along the lines what I was thinking about what's the best way forward. Are we going to have a empty site in our uh, in our village um, for a long times to come, probably, or are we able to to make some kind of move forward by um, um, accepting and going forward with the recommendation of the, the officers on this particular application. So I would be happy to make an amendment if there would be uh, a, a move to to refuse. Thanks. Thank you, Anouk. Right. Um, anyone else got any comments or wants to say something? Good. Do we have a motion? Councillor Brown. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think um, this is actually part of, it's not just this site that's isolated, as I understand. Not that not that um, that's relevant, but it maybe provides context. There's, there's, a, there's lodges um, nearby and um, the site appears to be used and I did I was in the village and I did my own from the public footpath looked at the site myself last week and there's caravan on it it, it seems to be being used there's some um there's some materials I'm sorry Councillor it. Brown but oh. we've, we've passed discussion okay. and if right. you're not wanting to move a motion that's fine so it's interrupt you sorry. but we're very tight on time sure. uh, and we've uh, got to move thanks. on thanks yeah sorry I will propose a motion that we move to um, do not accept the recommendation to grant, and we do not um, if re, uh, do not depart from policy nine P nine um, cultural heritage P nine point three conservation area the CMPA twenty one um, LDP and policy seven historic assets and places of MPF four. And I hope that's competent. Um, from Barbara's perspective. Uh, yep, yeah, thanks Councillor Brown. I think your motion is to refuse the recommendations um, as you don't want to depart from the pertinent policies as, as recommended in the report. So I'd be satisfied with that if Neil's uh, in agreement with that as well. Well, yeah. no, not quite. I mean, it's the, de the departure is saying that it doesn't meet policy, but there's justification to set that aside. So uh, I suppose you'd boil more into the exact wording of what the policy failings are and why you feel it's non-compliant with with policy, uh, what is it, 9.3 of the, the National Park Local Development Plan. So it, it would be use, using the wording within the policy and what the shortcomings of the application are in the context of that. It's not a case of saying I don't want to depart. It's it's why does this not meet the policy? Because we're you're looking to refuse this. Councillor Brown, do you want to alter your motion? Let me just review the word in chair. Is it competent to say that I don't want to part from 9.3 um, CMPA 2021 um, conservation areas CMPA plan on the basis that permission was not sought to and the, the permission was not sought and I don't agree with setting that aside? No. I'm afraid not. Again, that's that's looking at the actions and how we've got to where we've got. That that we're not. You can't make a planning decision based on the actions of the applicant. You have to make the planning decision based on planning reasons and material planning considerations. And sorry, as a, a, apologies if I wasn't clear. 
your reason for refusal is to refuse the application. The reason is it it, it it's not starting to say the recommendation is depart. If you disagree with that, it's not a case of saying, well, I don't want to depart. Your conclusion is that you do not feel that this application complies with policy. That That's kind of the end of it. There's no do or don't depart around that. It, it's your motion is that this does not meet the policy. So you want this refused T to try and help move it along. The, the relevant section in 9.3 and the bit we're departing from is that there is a presumption against development, which would result in the loss of a building which makes a positive contribution to its character. So what you are sta really stating is the building that existed on site made such a positive contribution to its to the character of the conservation area that, it, that its loss is not acceptable and therefore the proposal fails to comply with policy 9.9 .9 part three of the Cairngorms National Park Local Development Plan. If that helps, Councillor Brown. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Neil. Thank you, Neil. Are you okay with yeah. that, Barbara? Thank you. Yeah, that's fine. I just wanted to sort of remind Councillor Brown as well, if she wants to take a minute to have a look at the pertinent section of the policy. There's no, I realise we're rushed for time today, but it is important that she makes her motion in appropriate terms. So if she wanted to take a second to clarify or remind her on that, there, there is that opportunity as well. Do you want to take advantage of that, Sarah? Okay. Councillor Petrie? Well, we're with you, Sarah. Yeah, well, I just thought while we're waiting for Councillor Brown, um, instead of her moving a motion, can I just step in then and move a motion um, that we grant in line with the recommendations, um, which would then allow Councillor Brown to put forward an amendment to that and gives her time to look at the wording. Um, and I, I don't want to repeat myself too much because I'm aware of time and et cetera today, but essentially I don't feel comfortable in the slightest with where we are on this. But I think as a committee, we have to be practical and looking at a way forward. And therefore, I think the way to do that is to grant this application and then to keep the democratic ability of this committee to decide what goes next in terms of planning applications or use of that site as well. So um, I would just move a simple motion there to, to grant in line with the recommendations. Thank you, Councillor Petrie. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Ross? I'm happy to second that. I'm not happy where we are where we are. However, we consider the facts that we have in front of us on the day um, in the paper and what uh, Councillor Petrie has said makes sense. I am more than happy to endorse her because of that. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Uh, Councillor Brown. Thanks. Thanks, Chair. I've got I've got the policy in front of me, so I'm moving an amendment now to um, not depart from 9.3 conservation areas that the um, under 9.3a um, that there's not sufficient information to depart from policy um, around the basis of the building was of um, to preserve and enhance the character and appearance. The building was of significant importance as to preserve and enhance the character and appearance of um, its location and its setting. And um, is that sufficient? And ask Barbara to confirm. I think uh, Neil was going to speak first. If you'd like to come in, Neil. Neil. Yeah, it, it's, it's Councillor Brown. As you're trying to do, um, you've got to you've got to look at the policy wording. Um, and if that's your conclusion that the building made a positive contribution to the character of the conservation area, and um that its loss is unjustified and the proposal is contrary to part 9.3 of policy 9 of the Cairngorms National Park Local Development Plan. That That's fine. Thank you. Uh, can I ask, uh, Gwyneth, can you summarise your motion? Uh, I think I've probably covered it all when I proposed the motion. Janelle? Yeah, just confirming that um, Councillor Turvey is happy with that wording as the seconder to Councillor Brown. Yes, happy with that. Thank you. Thank you. So move move on to vote. Uh, Kirsty, could you take us through? Chair, so the motion is from Councillor Petrie, seconded by Councillor Ross, to grant in line with the report recommendations. 
The amendment is from Councillor Brown, seconded by Councillor Turvey, um, to refuse the application uh, for the reasons outlined. Councillor Brown. Amendment. Councillor Turvey. Amendment. Councillor Goodall. Motion. Councillor Cloppert. Motion. Councillor Petrie. Motion. Councillor Ross. Motion. There are four votes for the motion and two votes for the amendment, so the motion is carried. Right, thank you everyone. That's the, the motion carried and we confirmed the decision to uphold the officer's recommendation uh, in retrospect. On to our next one. We might... Now, item six, application 2023 stroke 0190, conservation area consent for demolition of fire damaged building. Retrospective, one, again. It's the next one on chair. That's the wrong one. one. I'm looking at the yeah. wrong one. I'm getting too <laughs> tired. Okay, item seven. Full planning permission to repair boundary walls and fences and formation of hard standing and stone drain soakaway. Part retrospective at Braemar Lodge Hotel, 6 Glenshee Road, Braemar. If I could advise the committee, there is a request to speak from Bruce Luffman, an objector, and ask if the committee agrees to hear Mr Luffman speak. I don't see any objections. Can I confirm that the speaker is on the call, please? Yes, he's still on the call, Chair. Thank you. Again, I'll, I will advise the speaker as part of protocol. The committee will first hear from the planning officer that you'll be invited to address the committee. In line with the guidance you have received, please mute your microphone when not speaking if your phone permits this. You can unmute using the code star six when, not re when required. Please do not speak unless I invite you to do so, and please do not interrupt other speakers. You will be given up to five minutes to speak. After that, members may ask questions. You will then be entitled to remain in the meeting for the rest of the item, although your microphone will be muted. Can I ask Neil Mayer, Senior, Senior Planning Officer, to present the report? Thank you, Chair. So this obviously follows straight on the back of the previous item. Um, the demolition of the hotel is now lawful. Um, this application relates to what shall happen with the ground um, in the short term. Um, it's before you today following referral by local members and following receipt of public comments. Oh, sorry, we can move on here. So this is the photographs of the site as existing. Um, obviously a lot of works taken place, hence part of the application being retrospective in nature. Um, there's salvage material which has been referenced in the past and this is um, the recent views of the site from a few months ago. Um, there's a portion of the wall to be repaired here and um, that fence is very much a temporary measure along that common boundary. You'll see the detail as we go through the application as to what's proposed there. Um, there's the outline of, of the hotel and the site, and this is an overview of the site, the proposed situation. Um, there's been concerns and complaints from surface water runoff um, following the removal of all the materials on site. Um, this application addresses that through, you can see the blue hatchings there, that is a, a filter trench. Um, through the course of the application that was looked at and the ground is going to be graded from that central area to fall to the trench but also from the outer edges to fall into the site so that it, it captures the it, water captures uh, gathers in that trench and we've got the certification to show that the ground conditions are suitable to basically allow that whole trench to function as a soak away to manage surface water and, and ensure that it does not um, flow onto neighbouring properties or out with the site. In terms of the boundary treatments, this is the proposed fence that's to be reinstated along the common boundary with the adjoining um, house and the stone boundary wall metal railings retained um, and reinstated um, at, the, at the entrance there. So that's really it, Chair. This is the, the application to 
reinstate the site um, until such time as as we hope um, something comes comes forward in the future to um, make use of the site and, and improve its appearance in the conservation area. So this is recommended for approval. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Neil. Do members have any questions for Neil? Councillor Cloppert. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, Neil, I'm just I'm just wondering, did you say that's going to be a wooden fence along the, you know, the adjacent property? And is that um, when water moves against a newly reinstated wall, will that not then still allow for um, water to drain in, into the next door's property? So, so yes, this this is the fence that would go along this common boundary to the neighbouring property. That's what's proposed there, and along the top side is where a section of the wall is going to be reinstated. This is the drainage plan that shows the levels detail. So, so this left hand side here is that common boundary where the fence is going to go. But you can see this arrow here that is showing the overland flow and the grading of the ground. So, any water that falls on the site side of the timber fence is going to fall towards this filter drain, this cutoff drain. Nothing from this site is going to fall towards this timber fence. It's going to be captured by this drain. There will be no runoff from the site to that neighbouring property, um, as shown on this drainage layout. Are you happy with that, Councillor Cloppert? Well, I'll, I, well I'll, take, I'll take Neil's word for it. He is the expert after all. Councillor Brown. Certainly not, Chair. It's it's based on the drainage engineer. They're the expert. <laughs> Thank you for the correction. Thanks. Um, thanks very much, Neil. Um, just for clarification, which part is the respective part? The, the drainage has already been ta taken care of. That element has happened and the, the wall is the matter that's being considered. Is that right? Drainage is partially done. It's been partially done. Yeah, I believe I believe the trench has been done, but the regrading shown on the drainage plan hasn't been completed yet. And the, the, the replacement fence isn't up yet. The status of the wall reinstatement, don't know the current situation with that. But again, uh, as, as we mentioned in the first one, I, Applications that are retrospective in nature, you, you can't give weight to to the what has and what hasn't. We're still consenting to this development as a whole. So if approved, the resultant outcome would be for all that is contained, the wall reinstatement, the fence, the filter trench and the grading of the site would all gain approval um, through this application. Thanks, Neil. Um, in in terms of the um, information, the, a lot of representation mentions contamination on the site. And I know SEPA initially said that it, the matter was too small or insignificant for them to look at. And there does seem to be some correspondence from them in March that indicates they're satisfied that there's waste transfer notes and evidence of importation of sub-base. Um, but they have no reason to suspect the inappropriate burial, disposal, hotel demolition materials. But is it is it right to say that there's actually no checks done at the um, footprint of the hotel around contamination? Yeah, that's it. That's it. Um, and our own contaminated land team have have kind of followed the advice of SIPA really um, that they don't require anything now. It's not. From our point of view, if if the expert consultees on the matter are saying there's no issue, then it's not our place to make an issue of it. Um, we've got the responses that's fed in from SEPA and our own contaminated land team to say that they are content with the application as it sits with an informative to go on the decision notice um, to outline that should any contamination of the ground be discovered during any development, then the planning authority is notified immediately. So it, it it's and that that's a very common approach. It's informatives that go on and and at that point our contaminated land team would would get involved and look at site investigation and whatnot. But for the purposes of the planning application and and where things are at on the ground, you've captured it exactly. Um SEPA and our own contaminated land team have no issues or concerns. Yeah, thanks. Um the 
one of the reports, I think it's a record of works from the construction um, company mentioned that they had to mechanically drop the building and sift through the rubble. I think land language was used to, in order to find the um, bits of granite, I think, that they've preserved on the site. I think that was the word used. So, um, you know, given the fact that it was probably knocked down like in that way, it's not to say that there wouldn't be contamination. And it looks like there has been no checks of the ground in the footprint of the hotel is that is that right because i mean what i understand from um sa mcgregor's reports around there's there's mention of topsoil there's mention of building rubble on one of the um one of the pits that were tested they were all out of the footprint as i understood the the three elements of the areas that were tested were all out of the footprint um, and the area has been built up in, in parts as well. So, I mean, CEPRA have said they've got no reason to suspect that there's been inappropriate material or burial or disposal of materials. But it sounds like you couldn't see evidence of the actual footprint being checked by anyone. Is that is that right? The actual footprint has had no ground, you know, there's been no digging, no checking. There has been no intrusive site investigation undertaken because the experts, SEPA and our contaminated land team, have said it's not been necessary. Given the development proposed here, which is an area of hard standing and a filter trench around the edge of it, there's no, there's no risk. Um, I would fully expect if in the near future an application came forward for development that at that time, there would be an intrusive site investigation required, for example, if, if if housing was to come on board or there was going to be some more intrusive groundworks to form the foundation or something. Um, that that would most likely be an issue in the future. Um, when I say issue, something that requires address, not that it's a problem, there would, there would be the, the, the suitable site investigations carried out at that time. But for the scope of this application and trying to avoid repeating myself, but we have the input from SEPA and our contaminated land team that have said no specific intrusive groundworks are required and they are happy with the information that they have to hand to conclude that there's no issues in relation to contamination from this proposed application. Thanks, Neil. So you, you just clarified there that at any future application, obviously foundations would need to be laid, that there would be a requirement for actual testing of the footprint of the hotel to evidence, you know, the condition and even what the material is under that footprint, that that would come as part of a planning application in the future. Is that right? Yeah, most likely, most likely for, for almost any development on what is could be termed made ground, there would likely need to be some sort of testing of the ground condition. Um, but it's it's not it's not an issue for today. For the purposes of this, we've got the information on file again, and we've got the input from our consultees. So hopefully that gives you comfort at this time. Thank you, Neil. Thank you, Councillor Brown. Councillor Ross, if we could stick to the uh, remit at hand and and not the, the, and not uh, try and drift. We don't have a lot of time. Thank you. Sorry, could you repeat that? I didn't understand what you said. Neither did I when I said it. I'm just trying to buzz things along. If we could stick to Back, planning yeah, policy in matters. Front of us, yes, yeah, yes I'm you. happy to do that. Um, the papers in front of us have objections, and in the objections it's been mentioned that there is runoff into neighbouring gardens. How will that be mitigated? How can that be mitigated with given the context of the wall and the fence and everything that we've got. I know there's a drainage report, but having said that, um, there are objectors who have concerns about this. So I wondered, and I, I listened to the, the response you gave to Councillor Clopart too, but I am concerned about the runoff. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think in the context of, of this one, Councillor Ross, it, it probably overlaps with a response given to Councillor Brown earlier when she was asking about which parts are retrospective. Now, the original drainage design that came in just showed the fall from the centre of the site to the trench around the edge. But following the receipts of the representations about the runoff, quite rightly, the question was put that the trench doesn't go around the, the complete outer edge of the site. It, it's, it's set within the site. And the, the developer acknowledged that, and that's why we got the, the, the subsequent drainage report that shows a fall from the outer edge of the site. Now, it's showing a fall. It's not, 
it, it's it's a, it's a slight raising of the level at the outer edge of the site to to direct the water back to that filter trench. It's very minor in terms of a cross section being provided, for example. But that that there is the mitigation to stop runoff. So the concerns were quite rightly made by representees and they were shared by ourselves and put to the applicant and their consultant responded accordingly and has given us this revised drainage plan that showed the the levels falling in from the outer edge of the site so it's been addressed um, and shown by by the the consultant the applicant's consultant engineer Are you happy with that, Councillor Ross? You have a further question? No, I've no further question at the moment. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you, Neil. Do we have any other, other questions for Neil? No. I shall ask uh, Bruce Luffman to address the meeting. You have a maximum of five minutes, Mr. Luffman. Are you on the call? Can we confirm that Mr. Luffman is still on the call, please? Mr. Luffman, can you hear us? You may need to unmute your phone again. Mr. Luffman, can you hear us? Okay, we don't appear to be able to hear you, Mr. Luffman. If you'd be able to leave the meeting and dial back in, and hopefully that will resolve the issue. Can you hear us now, Mr. Luffman? Yes, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you now, thank you. Lovely, thank you. May I proceed, Chair? Yes, Mr. Luffman, you have five minutes starting now, thank you. Okay, well, I won't be agreeing with Neil, as you would expect. This application has many similarities to the application that precedes this one. It is the same site, the same applicant, and an application that has been validated for some considerable time since last November, and also is retrospective for the most part. Ironically, the report of works under point 0.62 of the paper suggests that this application should not consider the demolition of the former hotel, but this should not be accepted by the committee. The lengthy point 0.26 of the paper supports this application, and it is wholly about the circumstances of the fire and its aftermath, but seeks to contract the whole episode into an apparent tight timeline, which is certainly not the case. Point 26 covers a time period of immediately after the fire with a building survey indicating limited de demolition to make it safe and report by CRGP two months after complete demolition and six months after the fire. My point is that 26 is seeking to seemingly validate the illegal action of the applicant by asking for the previous retrospective planning application, which was not forthcoming until seven months after the demolition and then 18 months for determination. So that's two and a half years from the fire. This application is therefore a result of that illegal demolition covered in the previous application, which produces the unauthorized formation of the hard standing and localized flooding to the properties to the west, Ellendale and Balmellon House. Point 26 further uses the evidence of waste transfer licenses to indicate that materials were taken from the site following the fire, and therefore this evidence satisfies SEPA and the planning service. 
This outcome does not show that all contamination was taken from site. And we must remember that this unapproved demolition was not monitored, as it was done without the knowledge of the planning service, and almost a year passed before action was taken by the authorities and some soil tests were done by the applicant. The testing by S.A. McGregor shows only that the land is suitable for a such drainage system, no more. No testing was done for contamination by SEPA, the Council Contaminated Land Services, or the applicant. While the testing may show free draining ground, they also show original topsoil at almost a metre de- down in pit two. This immediately indicates that a considerable area of ground and depth of material from the hotel fire buried on site, with no indication of its content. The proposal by SEPA and Contaminated Land Service is that an affirmative, and not even a condition, is applied to an approved application for any contamination discovery. Given an informative, the applicant has demonstrated by their attitude to due process that it is unlikely to be adhered to, as many informatives are not. On the face of it, the proposal for constructing a such, such channel around the site, as shown, seems a way forward. But it takes no account that Ellendale is well below the one metre drainage channel, and Barn Ellen House is lower than that, and possible contaminated seepage through the soil to the west will be a risk, because it doesn't just go anywhere, it goes, follows the line of, of, the, of the, the slope. The committee should be aware that no surface flooding ever took place before the unapproved construction of this hard standing. There is an active water source only 37 metres away from the proposed such channel, running down immediately behind the site's lodges, and surface water is currently running in channels from the lower area where the site lodges are positioned immediately beside the hard standing. This water course is shown on proposed site plan page nine. This is an area that I enforced on when dealing with the Canmore site's construction, so I have intimate knowledge of this area. The recommendation is for this such drainage channel be, to be constructed before the use of the site. And by the way, it has not been constructed yet. But it is already being used for a whole variety of uses already. Caravan, vehicles, plant and construction materials. So it is very unlikely that the applicant will follow due process. I respectively suggest that this application does not comply with a number of the relevant policies ident- itemised in the report and should be refused. An enforcement action taken to require the applicant to remove all of the made up ground as identified in the soil engineer's report. This action would then permit a substantial wooden fence, not the one that's there at the moment, to be erected above the reduced hard standing level and stop surface water keeping down to Ellendale and Balmellon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Loughman. Do members have any questions for Mr. Loughman? No. No questions. Mr. Loughman, do you feel you have had a, a fair hearing, an opportunity to present your case? Of course I do, Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Loughman. Neil, would you like to make any comments on the issues raised by the by Mr. Loughman uh, in his uh, speech? Um, thanks, Chair. The, the surface water runoff issue is probably the, the main thing there. That notably, it's come through representations, and Mr. Loughman <coughs> repeated it there as well. That until this site was was cleared of the hotel and, and surfaced, there was no surface water issue. Um, and as was touched on before, the issue's known. Um, it's a problem and we've got the drainage design through this application that, that is recommended for approval. And that in turn, once that drainage situation's put in place as per the supporting information from the applicant's drainage engineer, with that grading and the filter tranche, that will address the issue. Um, I suppose the one thing to pick up on, of course, and Mr. Luffman's correct, that y- you can argue that <clears throat> the site has already been brought into use due to the retrospective nature of the application. So there is perhaps a slight flaw in condition two there. 
where it states that the development shall not be brought into use unless the surface water drainage system is being provided. Um, committee may want to give some consideration to that. Perhaps we amend that condition slightly to put a time scale to instruct um, that that drainage arrangement shall be fully put in place as per the approved plans within a period of three months from the date of permission. Um, that perhaps gives us a more enforceable timeline to ensure that that channel is is put in place sooner rather than later. Um, but other than that, Chair, nothing else. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. Do members have any further questions for Neil? Oh. Do members have sufficient information to determine the application? Councillor Brown. Thanks, Chair. Um, I'd like to propose a site visit. So I'd really like to understand the site levelling, um, the ground that's been built up that was spoken about, where the soil testing was done um, off, off the footprint. Um, Mr Luffham just mentioned about a different height of the ground and the fence. Um, so on that basis, um, I'd like to have a, a ha the opportunity to see the site and have that explained to me by um, Neil in, in person, if possible. Thank you, Sarah. So you don't have sufficient information and you request a site visit. I'd like is to anyone, Is anyone of a like mind? No one else? Yeah. Councillor Turvey? Yeah, happy how many to come members, with If I could ask um, perhaps Barbara, how many members do we need to request a site visit uh, so it's, it's a valid visit? Uh, Kirsty? Uh, Chair, we would need a motion and amendment and then we would take a vote. That's fine. Thank you. Now we have a motion. Sarah, you proposed, proposed the motion of a site visit. And uh, EPA, you have seconded it. Seconded it. I'm getting more and more tongue tied as the time as time goes on. Yes. So, do we have an amendment? Councillor Cloppert. Yes, thank you. Hi. Yes. Um, I was there yesterday, so for me personally, I I wouldn't really need one. But if anybody else wishes to, please, um, go ahead. But I don't think. And I would be quite happy to put in an amendment should this be supported by anybody else. Would you like to put forward an amendment, Anouk? Um, I can, you know, yes, if there would be uh, support for that. Thanks. And your amendment is no site visit? Yeah. Councillor Petrie, seconder. Yeah, sorry, my, even my computer buttons have given up at that time of day. Um, I I can understand the request for the site visit. Personally, I think like Councillor Clopper, I don't Clopper, I don't know what it would add to what's before us in terms of we've we've seen pictures. I'm not sure that being on site will show us anything different than from what we've seen in the pictures or from what we've heard from the technicians, etc. Maybe that's not the correct word. It's that time of day. But in terms of what we've heard, I don't know what the site visit would add. So I would support Councillor Clopper in saying we don't need one. I understand why some members do and happy for it to go ahead. I just wouldn't be in attendance at it. You've confused me, Councillor Petrie. Sorry, I don't support the site visit. <laughs> so we support the amendment. Uh, yeah, I know. I'm, I'm, I'm in the same position myself. Um, so we have a motion and we have an amendment. Kirsty, could you take us through the voting procedure? Thank you, Chair. So the motion is from Councillor Brown, seconded by Councillor Turvey to go for a site visit for the reasons outlined by Councillor Brown. The amendment is from Councillor Cloppert, seconded by Councillor Petrie not to go for a site visit. Councillor Brown. Uh, motion. Councillor Turvey. Motion. Councillor Goodall. Motion. Councillor Cloppert. Amendment. Councillor Petrie. Amendment. Councillor Ross. Amendment. So there are three votes for the motion and three votes for the amendment. So the chair would have a casting vote. 
and you, you give me the difficult decision. I'm the bad guy to half of you, no matter what I choose. Um, given I uh, supported the motion, then I propose that we have a site visit. So that's so my vote is uh, site visit. Kirsty, could you confirm? Thank you, Chair. Therefore, um, the motion is carried to undertake a site visit. Thank you. Given that we have a site visit, then that's uh, this uh, application dealt with for the moment. Um, there's nothing else we need to discuss on this until we've actually had the uh, the site visit. Kirsty, can you can can you confirm that, please? Yes, sure. That would be my understanding, um, and we could confirm the date for the site visit later. Thank you. Can someone call in uh, Councillor Blackett, her chair? So I don't think in, well, this is Duke Street Huntley, so there's no reason for her not to be in attendance. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, and thank you, Jeff, for covering for me there. Uh, we now move on to the application for um, planning permission for external alterations to the, a shop to form an extension to a dental practice at Huntley Dental Practice. Um, Neil, over to you. Thanks, Chair. Kirsty, is there a request to speak on this? Yes, Just... Chair. There's, yeah, there's a request to speak, Chair. Chair, are you still there? Are you on mute? Yeah, did you not hear me? No, sorry, we didn't hear you. Oh, sorry. Um, I said um, I thanked Councillor Goodall for uh, covering for me while um, I was out of the room and um, said that I was now back and we were moving on to um, full planning permission to um, external alterations to the shop to form extension to dental practice at Huntley, Huntley Dental Practice and I handed over to Neil and then I wondered why there was silence. Sorry Chair, it was just that there's a request to speak from Jennifer Ross, the agent, oh, so right. it was just to get the committee's agreement okay, for that do, request. Do we agree to hear from um, Jennifer Ross, the agent? And yes. I take, yeah, perfect. Thank you. Is she on the call? Yes, she is, Chair. Thank you. OK, um, so I will ask Neil to present the report and then Jennifer, can you hear us? Can she hear us? Is she Kirsty? still? Oh, yeah. Can she hear us, Kirsty? Um, I hope so. Um, Miss Ross, if you could um, unmute your phone if you can or just let us know if you can hear us you can dial star six um, if you don't have a mute button Can you hear us? Jennifer? I can hear you, yes. Good. OK, well, um, thank you for um, attending. And I'm sorry it's taken so long to get to this application. Um, we are now going to hand over to Neil for the um, to present the um, application. And then I will invite you to address the, um, the meeting and you'll have um, a maximum of five minutes. So I'll hand over to Neil. OK. Thanks, Chair. Um, so this one's before committee today because it's an application being recommended for approval um, against the advice from our consultee and our built heritage team. It basically relates to changes to the facade of um, a retail unit 37 Duke Street, which 
Um, there's a shop next door at the dental practice. It's vacant and the dental practice has taken over the unit, expanding through into that unit and is just looking for uniformity from its own existing signage um, to, to get this building to look the same and look part of it. So um, this is the shop in red, just out of shot to the left hand side, you can see the dental surgery um, as a shop unit. It had its door in the center of the two windows. Uh, there's a dental practice adjacent, so you can see obviously the, the difference in the colouring and detailing and whatnot. Uh, you can see the, the flaking paint and, and dry timber of, of the existing um, windows. And coming away a bit there. So here's our location on the corner of Church Street and Duke Street. There's the existing elevations. And here is our proposed elevation. So it's working within the existing space. It's a dummy door that's going in the middle um, and the, the fenestration, the windows are, are largely similar to what's there. And the colouring then goes from red to the, the dark grey to tie in with the dental practice next door. Um, you'll see in the report that Bill had its team, they, they asked for some additional information and changes to the detailing initially. Um, the applicant carried out a good amount of support and information and, and made some changes. Um, Built Heritage team were still not quite happy with the proposal um, and maintained their objection, but from the planning services point of view, we're quite content that what's before us now in terms of the detailing and the treatment of the building within the conservation area proposes a, a, a frontage that's fully appropriate for the street scene and um, most importantly al allows this expansion of the dental practice to take place, removes a vacant unit from the street and, and we'll see a bit of regeneration um, in, in the settlement in the conservation area in the town centre in Huntley. So um, we are supporting this one um, in the planning services view as being compliant with the relevant policies in the local development plan. Um, but as I mentioned, it's before you today because uh, our built to heritage team maintain their objection. Thanks, Chair. You're still on mute, Chair. Sorry. My internet flickered then. Um, does anybody have any questions for Neil? And I don't see any hands up. So um, I'll now hand over to Jennifer Ross, the agent. Jennifer, you have five minutes and then members might have um, questions afterwards. OK, can you hear me OK? Perfectly, perfectly. OK, um, OK, thank you very much for your time. I'd just like to provide some more details um, on the benefits of the development, um, not just for the dental practice, but for the surrounding community. Um, Huntley Dental Practice um, is currently providing NHS and private dental care in Aberdeenshire. Um, the practice currently has five fully equipped surgeries providing dental care to 10 to 12,000 patients. It's running at full capacity. However, the two proposed surgeries will accommodate an additional two to 3,000 patients. The practice is well established at Duke Street and the natural expansion of the business would be to extend into the adjoining vacant premises at Reed Florey. The Reed Florey building is identified in the management plan as a redevelopment site. It has been vacant for over six years and over time has deteriorated. The existing shop front is in a semi-derelict state and is currently detracts from the character of the area and the aspirations of the area management plan. The 2023 Huntley Town Centre Health Check indicates that the community are concerned with the number of vacant units within the town centre. At the time of the survey, it was noted that 31% of units are vacant, which was higher than the previous year and double the Scottish average in town centres. The health check states that any work that can be completed to reduce the vacant rate within the town centre would be welcomed by the community. The proposed development will fill a vacant unit with the expansion of an existing business and will generate a footfall of around 15,000 people. There are a few businesses aside from the supermarkets which attract that number of people into the town centre to Huntley. It's expected that patients would be inclined to visit other facilities and retail units when they visit the dental practice for appointments. 
It is the intention to replace the existing timber shop front with a similarly proportioned frontage, which will respect the character of the existing shop front, but at the same time be functional for the proposed use. The main frontage will predominantly remain glazed with openable windows at high level to provide ventilation to the proposed surgeries for the well-being of staff and patients. Existing features such as the recessed doorway and decorative tiled flooring will be retained. This will preserve the history and character of the shop. This style of shop front is typical of other properties on Duke Street, as well as the existing premises under ownership of the dental practice. When selecting suitable materials, advice has been sought from the Huntley Conservation Area Management Plan and the recommended Historic and Environment Scotland fabric improvements for the energy efficiency in traditional buildings. Double glazed windows are proposed in place of single glazed units as traditional glazing is drafty and responsible for significant heat loss. Climate Change Act 2009 commits Scotland to some of the most ambitious carbon reduction targets in the world. The historic environment has a huge role to play in this due to the significant amount of embodied energy held within their original construction. Replacing the existing windows with double glazed units will contribute towards these targets and far exceeds the requirements for a like-for-like -like, um, replacement of single glazing. In conclusion, the benefits of the proposal far outweigh the requirement for a like-for-like -like replacement. The development will preserve and enhance the character and appearance of the conservation area. It will occupy an existing shop, reducing the vacant rate within the town centre. It will allow the expansion of an existing business it will increase footfall in the town centre by two to 3,000 people, and it will retain existing features such as the tiled recess doorway. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Um, do any members have any questions? And I don't see any hands up, so um, thank you very much. And do you feel you've had a fair hearing and a fair opportunity to present your case? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, you can now remain in the meeting, but your microphone will be muted. Um, okay, Neil, you. sorry. Neil, do you have um, any comments to make on um, what Ms Ross has just said? Nothing at all, Chair. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, do members feel they have enough information to determine this application? given that there is still an unresolved objection from a consultee. Councillor Turvey, are you putting your microphone on to speak or no? <laughs> OK. Are we content to agree it? Yes. I think that's fine. I think then that application is granted. Thank you. Um, we can now move on to item nine, which is full planning permission for erection of a dwelling house and garage at Shemvel, Glengairn, Ballater, and I'll hand over to Neil. Thanks, Chair. Um, this one is up before members again due to a representation and referred by local members. Site is in a remote location. You can see the location on the cover sheet there and presents a brownfield opportunity for the erection of a single dwelling house. This is the remains that sit on site um, back in a snowy January day. And this is the view from the passing road with the site just out of shot there with the road passing and view looking westwards. And again, the location shown there in red. The access uh, They've shown on the plan the annotations of what roads require in terms of gradient and surfacing with the visibility displays extending around the corner and along the road. And site plan showing existing building and the proposed contemporary design dwelling with a surface water pond in the corner of the site, parking turning space um, along the northern edge of the site. There's the proposed elevations. You can see the two side elevations, east and west elevations, how the property works with the levels to effectively be two storey to its rear and single storey, albeit with a, with, a, with a high roof on the north elevation. Um, and got the garage shown here as well. Floor plans there. 
Site sections again show how the proposed building integrates into the landscape. The pitch of the roof largely ties in with the contouring and slope of the ground. Uh, and again, proposed sections there. This would be the southern elevation looking up towards the road, which isn't really any um, public view of the site. And this is 3D representation of the rear um, of the property looking northwards towards the passing road, and this would be the view from the public road. So there are no um, issues or objections. Oops, I've clicked right out of that. Um, we have one objection which raises issues in relation to the landscape impact and inappropriate design and materials. Of course, it's always quite a subjective matter, um, but you hopefully saw from the visualizations there, it's quite a contemporary design solution proposed, which works well with the site levels and the contours of the ground to integrate something that you could say is quite agricultural in its appearance, but certainly contemporary dwelling um, with, with modern fenestration and finishes. Plan and service are quite content with that as a design solution. And as I mentioned, there's no objections from any consultees subject to conditions relating to um, safeguards for, for um, private water supply, for example, and written scheme of investigation from an archeological point of view um, and, and usual things like that. So this one is recommended for approval. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Neil. Um, could you just go back to the picture of the road and show us where on the road the turning into it is going to be? Yeah, just bear with me, Chair. Yeah, yeah. So, not not far off where the rear of the car in this site visit photograph is. So um, I'll jump to the, the visibility display drawing as well here. So the photograph there had the car sitting just to the west of where the center point and the visibility display lines are. Um, now the displays shown here are for a 40 mile per hour road, or based on 40 mile an hour design speeds rather, but the speed limit of the road is 60 miles per hour. Um, but that's what's been accepted by Roads Development. I did have a, a conversation with um, Ken earlier. I think Ken might still be on the line as well if you've got more questions behind the, the logic and the thought process behind basically applying a reduced visibility calculation to this um, bit of road. It's based on the, the design speed of the road and the speed that vehicles are likely to travel. Um, but it, it's been accepted by Roads basically. Yeah. Here. I, I I do I do have concerns, um, mainly because if you're it's quite a steep hill. I know it well. The road is um, not um, a priority treatment road in the winter, and I mean I have seen occasions where people have been struggling to get up, but never struggling to get down. It's a matter of struggling to stop. And I'm, I just, I'm just a bit concerned that I'm treating it as a 40 mile an hour. So if Ken is here, it would be quite good to hear his view, given that it is a fast road. You get motorbikes on there. Now that the new bridge is there, you get buses, you get lorries, um, and you get people accelerating fast. Yeah, Chair, absolutely can 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 pull Ken in um, if he's on the line. I've got my screen maximised on the PowerPoint, so I can't see currently. But the one thing I would say, though, you're talking about the dangerous driving conditions in snow and ice. I would sincerely hope people wouldn't be driving uh, even at 40 in, in that weather, but I appreciate the point you're making. Uh, well, about... no, I'm, I'm not <laughs> suggesting that they'd be driving at that speed, but it's a matter of, of, you know, you come over the top of that hill and if somebody's pulling out you may not be able to stop. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that I think is my concern. So Ken, I see you're there. Can you reassure me, please? Um, uh, thanks, Chair. I, 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 I can't tell you that no one will ever 
ever slip on ice on, on that road. Uh, it's not something we would take into account in the measurement of a visibility display. There's no. It's based on. Uh, it's based on uh, design speed, as, as Neil said. That that is a that is the speed that most drivers will travel at. It, it's typically invisibility displays. You'd say it's it's the speed at which eighty five percent of the drivers travel at or less uh, forty miles an hour, which I think is a fair assumption on on that road. It's not saying it's the maximum speed. Um, if it was a new road, the gradient would be too steep uh, for for a, for new road standards. There's there's no question of that. Uh, you would have to rely on on winter maintenance being being good. Whether whether there's a huge safety risk there, I, I don't know if that's if that if that would affect the, the planning outcome on that. Um, it, it's a tricky one. Talking about road maintenance, effectively, you'd have to basically say that the road sometimes won't be maintained. I don't think we can say that as a as a road service, because because obviously it will it will be a it's an a, it's an A class road, so it'll be a priority road with regards to maintenance, and obviously the type of road it is uh, as well. Um, and the, the the owners of the house who live there will certainly be aware of of that whenever there's the the, the, the there is poor weather and are likely to take more care. I, I think that's the best I can tell you. It's not something we would take into account in the measure of vis of a visibility display, though. That that's what I can tell you. So sorry, can I just ask you why, when it's a sixty mile an hour road, um, you only design the visibility display? requirements for a 40 mile i'm sure there's a good reason but i just don't know what it is yes it's it's it, i was trying to explain it there probably not very well it's it's the speed at which you think it, it, it's known as the 85th percentile speed and that is basically saying that the 85 percent of all drivers on that road will travel at a certain speed or or, or below so you're, you're basically saying that 85 percent of that dri of drivers on that road are, are likely to travel at 40 miles an hour or, or below which I think, based on the road type, is is, is reasonable. You, you mentioned buses and large vehicles; that they're not going to be travelling anywhere near that speed. That brings the speed down. It's not to say that fifteen percent won't travel a bit higher, but that's not how you design visibility displays. You don't you don't design for the worst case. You, you design for the eighty fifth percentile case. Surely, there's an element. Sorry to labour this point, but I'm mm -hmm. I'm really keen that this is a a safe road. Um, surely there has to be a degree of um, ability to stop if so if you're coming down that hill and suddenly somebody pulls out of that turning and it may not be the owner it might be the postie or it might be dpd or you know any other courier or it could be the bin lorry um because they've got they've got to i think go in to pick up and, and i'm just i know the road really well ken and i'm i'm just concerned I, I think I, I can't provide enough, like any kind of technical assurance, because we we don't have a measure of the speeds. Uh, the, the the only way you really you would be able to tell what the eighty fifth percentile speed is is to actually measure speeds at at the, the hundred and twenty meter point to to see if that was was the case. You'd have to do speed measurement to be to be sure. It's based on engineering experience looking at the road. Is that that we would look at that and say that the, the the 85th percent of speeds are likely to be uh, around about 40 or less. Um, the, the the slope again, I don't have enough technical information to know what that slope is. Whether it's a, a sort of 15, 20 percent slope uh, that has some effect, probably not a huge effect on on, on site stopping distance, uh, but it will have it would have some effect. You'd have to do a a more detailed technical appraisal of the site with with more information than than i have to to hand at the moment okay does anybody else have any questions councillor Cloppert, you asked for it to come to committee are you content that your reasons for calling it to committee have been satisfied um no i don't think we really have looked into the, the place making idea that uh, I, this is of course a, a brown side as we call it and the you know the, the principle of development comes from that but i'm just concerned i mean apart from indeed uh, the road being really you know rather 
steep as well. And it's also an, a, a beauty spot, a known beauty spot. Um, even uh, last night when I was driving past and stopping for a moment, um, many people were, were there uh, actually, um, uh, you know, just watching and um, and also having their camper vans up and everything. So um, I just, yeah, as it is so remote, um, I'm just really concerned that this will become another property, even though it might be somebody's dream property at the moment. And I can totally understand it. it's such a beautiful spot, um, but that it eventually will end up uh, another, uh, well, not empty home, but a second home or or a holiday cottage and for placemaking in in the Cairngorms Park. I mean, it's really something that uh, I, you know, I just wanted to discuss here. So I just don't know if any, anybody else has any concerns in that respect. I, I, I understand what you're saying, but I'm not certain that it's a planning matter. Neil, what do you, do you think? Well, you're recommending approval, so I'm sure you think that Councillor Clough is wrong. <laughs> well, I mean, wh whether whether it's someone's second home and they stay in it for one month a year or whether it's lived in year round, that's not a planning issue. The building design and the siting and the scale, that is the planning issue. So, again, whether it's lived in for one month or 12 months, it looks how it looks. So if you've got a concern about place making i mean is a single house a place um and this is the issue as well with that part of the policy and the the, the six characteristics that are largely similar similar in mpf4 as to what they are in the the park plan but distinctive safe pleasant welcoming adaptable resource efficient and so on it all comes back to design at the end of the day um and, and policy three of the park plan is about design and you also mentioned policy 10 about resources and so on i mean neither of these in the planning services view there's no shortcoming here again appreciate design uh, can be can be quite a subjective one and um, there's multiple design solutions that could come forward on the site of course but the one thing we've got here is a considered design it works with the contours and um, the cross section in particular you can see how the pitch of the roof it's not just plucked from obscurity it really follows the contours and helps integrate the house into the site um, and passing traffic and so on I suppose the hope is that they pass by and think wow that's a really quite iconic and interesting designed house others might drive past and think it's a, uh, a monstrosity of course but as you say chair um, that subjective uh, risk really um, but, We've lost you. Sorry, Councillor Clopper. You've lost. Sorry. Um, I don't know, Councillor Clopper, if there's anything further on your reason for referral that that you're wanting to. No, no, thank you. I, three and ten. It was. It was indeed just the, the place making. The, I mean, there is. Um, it, it couldn't. You know, the design doesn't really give me an idea that it would be could be considered, or there's even space enough for, to make it more like a croft. You know, to have have some land with it to work it, um, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, um, yeah, okay. From the from the planning point of view and consideration, if that's you know, I'm happy to go with the recommendations then. Thank you. I think my feeling about it is that um, I do have concerns about the road but there's not a lot I can do about it. Um, this is not a property that a local young person could afford to turn into a house. So even if somebody's using it as a holiday house, if they're spending their money in the area and bringing back an old building, you know, I mean, they're not bringing back the building, but, um, you know, using the place, then maybe that's a good thing. And I can see no reason to object. So from my perspective, um, I think it gets its planning permission. Does anybody have any other view? No. Neil, you've won again. Right. We're now on to item 10 which is mixed use development comprising 390 dwelling houses. Yeah. Oh, what's happened? Councillor you... Brown is leaving for this item. Yeah, can you, hear, can you hear me okay? Something yeah. happened to my screen then. 
went funny. Um, so mixed use development comprising 390 dwelling houses and commercial and business development. And it's about without compliance with condition 16, which is the roundabout on the A980 Raymoy Road of planning permission APP 2018 2796 at the site of Bankery North. Um, and Neil is going to present the report. Yes, thank you, Chair. Obviously, it relates to quite a significant application site. Um, but this application is really more of a procedural um, requirement than any sort of planning policy based assessment. You'll recall um, possibly the last committee, if not the one before, we had the site at Upper Lochton from Cala for phase 2B and 2C, I think it was. Um, anyway, the, the, the site that designed out the roundabout and brought in a staggered junction arrangement um, for the overall allocated sites at the north of Bankery, that was approved and um, the delegated matters have since been resolved. The consent's out the door, suspensive conditions have been met and I believe work has actually started on site. So um, Caller getting on with that and that of course, as I mentioned, designed out the roundabout, which this relates to the permission in principle, which covers the overall um, development site at the north of Bankery, both sides of the Raymore Road and both allocated sites within the local development plan. Within that permission in principle, there remained the condition that referenced a roundabout on the A980. So this application is basically just catching up to the events that, that have come out from the Cala site. And along with removing the conditional requirement for a roundabout, which has been replaced by one that looks at providing a staggered T-junction. There's also two other additional conditions that relate to um, connectivity and sustainable travel within the overall development site. So in short, it's an application that is making that long-standing plan and permission in principle that applies to the entire site, just making sure it remains competent and fit for purpose. So the recommendations, they are set out within the report chair with um, three amended conditions, or rather one amended condition and two additional conditions that relate to roads and connectivity issues, along with retaining all other um, conditions from the previous consent that remain applicable to future phases that may come forward under cover of that permission in principle. But the recommendation is to approve the application. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Neil. Um, do members have any questions for Neil? I don't see any. Oh, Councillor Ross. Thank you. May I go ahead? Yes, of course. Thank you. Um, there are a lot of conditions here, Neil, and I appreciate this is not about, as you said, the principle of planning, which I think some of the letters of objection have referred to. They've referred to not wanting more houses in Bankery. But this, as you said, is about the roundabout and the junction. Could you, first of all, for me, because I have quite a, a few questions. First of all, have you got pictures of where the junction will be or a diagram of where the junction will be in relation to the junction that was granted um, in the previous application? Please. Sorry, Councillor Ross, th th this relates to a permission in principle. This is amending the conditions on that permission in principle that removes yes. the need for a roundabout. The staggered junction, the detail of that is contained within the CALA application site. So there's no detail in this application. This is purely procedural to amend the conditions that apply to the permission in principle. So there is no detail in this application. OK, I, I appreciate that. But what are the two? What are the amended conditions then? Because there's there's a lot of them that you said there were two. I mean, there's a lot of conditions. What were the two conditions that have been specifically amended? Could you point me to those, please? It, well, it detailed in the report in 4.1, Councillor Ross, there's um, conditions being added that relate to the delivery of core path upgrades, a footway cycle link, public transport strategy, travel plan, and the phase and delivery of the access junction. Um, reading through the conditions, you'll see that in condition two, through the itemised matters there, there are 
elements there that relate to the provision of roads and footpaths. So that will capture what's in these future ones. We have got condition four about the paths. I mean, to be honest, you can compare this decision notice to the past decision notice if you wish. Um, I'm, I'm not convinced, that, well, sorry, not convinced the wrong word. I'm not sure what the relevance is of the question. You've got what effectively in the recommendation here is a revised permission and principle for the development. Like I say, it's about making this development or this consent, if granted, fit for purpose. The current permission and principle is hamstrung because circumstances have changed in relation to the junction. So this is now capturing that. Yes, I get that, but um, I mean, d d does the number d d if it's number four or number twenty two? I mean, I, I don't know the relevance of the number of the condition. We've got thirty one and thirty two are, are additional. That relates to core path upgrades. Condition thirty one. Condition thirty two relates to the footway and cycle links. The number in relation to the roundabout has changed. It is no longer condition. 16. Sorry, just a moment. My husband's 17. Just... 17 is now the junction. Right. Sorry, my husband came in then. Um, so I appreciate that, but where is the condition that, or was it previously noted or, or conditioned, I should say, that no house should be occupied until the junction had been put in situ? Is that still standing or has that changed? Yes, Councillor Ross. Condition 17, prior to the occupation of any dwelling in phase 2B or 2C, the access junction and improvement work shall be constructed and in blah, blah. Basically, yes, the phase that was approved that also has the conditions in place has largely been repeated on this application. That That's the purpose of this application is to ensure that this consent also remains fit for purpose and reflective of the consent that was recently granted for phase 2b and phase 2c mm, okay thank you i'll leave it at that for now councillor turvey you had your hand up are you happy okay do members feel that they have enough information now to determine this application and I don't hear anybody saying they don't. So um, are we happy to grant planning permission subject to the 32 conditions that are laid out um, in the report? Oh, Councillor Ross. Thank you. I've got my hand up because um, in, on page 10 and in... 6.6, uh, .6, and I'm, I'll probably get shot down here, but anyway, as part of the alteration to, the, to a staggered arrangement, Raymoy Road will undergo significant upgrades. We know that with, with the previous application. It, it talks about the widening of the road, a two metre footpath constructed on both sides and the two reference points. I don't, I still don't see any reference to the, whilst we're told that this is um, the details this is in principle. I still don't see in here any reference to the dip in the road as you're coming along Raymoyer Road as to that being um, addressed. And whilst this is supposed to be in principle, there's still a lot of detail in here about Raymoyer Road. And I'm concerned about the safety on Raymoyer Road. I appreciate that the new junction, it said, is going to make the road safer, but I'm not convinced. And when I read in 6.5 that the junction assessment submitted with the application states that the traffic modelling assessment has determined that a proposed staggered junction will provide enough capacity, I have concerns again because there are, and maybe I'm getting confused, but from what I can understand, we're going to have the junction, then we've got another junction coming out um, by the cow shed 
and there's three cottages there and visibility what with the dip in the road further up and then further down with the cow shed the gate might ha have been closed on this in the previous application but it is still being referred to here so i would like clarity from neil please and he may have covered this already and i may have missed what he was saying but i still want assurance that from what i can gather is, is it just the one junction was which has already been approved or are there because of the reference made to desktop uh, sorry to junction assessments and one thing or another there is no further junction going in is that correct this well this this has no de there's no detail being consented here this is amending the conditions on an existing permission in principle yeah it, it refers to the details that's been approved for phase 2b and 2c that's been considered i appreciate the concerns you had on that application when it was it was determined um we're not revisiting any of that I we're get not that. changing any of that we're making this permission i mean th th this application could have came in before that it could have, and it would have said the same things. What condition 17 does is make pro make provision for junction arrangements, the detail of junction arrangements to serve 2B and 2C to come forward, to be assessed and accepted, and then to be built and delivered prior to the occupation of any homes in phase 2B and 2C. Now, the conditions worded like that, because that's what it needs to do. We need to have the suitable road infrastructure to serve those phases. It's worded like that because let's say the consent that was granted previously on the Cala site, if that never got implemented and then it expired, it can't expire now because it's been implemented. But anyway, if that never came to fruition, well, under this application, an MSC application can come in, meet the requirements of this condition, design that junction and deliver the development in accordance with this permission. That's why we're updating this. It's to reflect what's happened and make it fit for purpose. What we know now is that it's not going to be a roundabout. It's going to be a staggered junction. This condition, this consent, this application takes account of that. It doesn't limit the design solution to be exactly that. It's got scope for change. Should a different design solution ever come forward? Likelihood of that's highly slim given Cala are on site and getting underway there. But this just piggybacks uh, on, on what's gone before and it ensures that the permission in principle that covers the allocated sites for Bankery remains fit for purpose so that when phase 1B or 1C comes forward they know what's required in terms of the road infrastructure. So basically when phase the, the next phases come forward then there will be in in, in those applications there will be details of maybe perhaps further junctions or whatever it it's highly unlikely to be further junctions it would repeat and provide the detail of those consented junctions in the cala site because remember that was a staggered junction yes whilst the the cala site just related to one side of raymore road it made the junction provision for the eastern side of raymore road so when the phases come forward on that eastern side they will they will repeat that detail to show that this is this is their leg of that staggered junction and how that then leads into that site okay. and those phases and so on. So okay. it's okay. it's it, it the simplest way I can try to explain it, Councillor Ross, is it, it's just making this consent fit for purpose because okay. currently I, I, that consent asks for a roundabout and this is making sure that it aligns with with that staggered junction arrangement. I hear you and I'm I'm content that no property will be occupied until the necessary junctions have been put into or road road works or whatever junctions have been put into place so thank you good so are we now content to approve this application and i don't see anybody saying no so i'm now going to propose as you have all been sitting here for over two hours that we have um a five minute break is that enough for people? I think you've got to stretch your legs. Um, Councillor Petrie. 
Yeah, thanks, Chair. Happy to have a break. Um, I do need to leave at five, though, for childcare reasons. And I do have concerns about us running over that time, just in terms of fairness to committee members. Um, you know, I think we block off until five because um, that's what's in the diary. And I think I, I will find it really difficult to come back after that because I'll have an overexcited five-year-old in the background. So I do have concerns about us going past five and would ask if there's any other options available other than that to ensure that we can um, continue to participate in business. I'll 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 call um Janelle in at this stage. Yeah, um I suppose we've got two options. We can adjourn to another date, um, which would be either we could continue this evening and just um suspend standing orders to go beyond five o'clock. We obviously need to be coded, so as terms of my area committee is we, we need at least three members to remain. Um, beyond five o'clock if that's what members uh, choose to do or we can adjourn till tomorrow uh, morning and then pick up then. I can't actually do tomorrow morning I've got a meeting um, but Councillor Goodall. I've got a licensing. Councillor Turvey. Uh, Sorry, I, I apologise to you, I thought you were asking. I did say something that you're going to jinx us with the, with the <laughs> five o'clock comments, but yes, I, I also have to go at um, quarter to five, so, and I have an appointment at ten o'clock tomorrow. Okay, um, Councillor Clopper. Yes, I can do tonight or tomorrow, that's... Okay, so... I, I'm I'm I won't say I'm I, happy, but I will I would continue tonight. Um Jeff, would you continue tonight? No, I mean I've got after another five. appointment. I was just okay. going to say I'm licensing tomorrow, but um tonight I, I have to leave at five o'clock. Uh, okay. Um um Anne, what about you? I'm free tonight, but not tomorrow or Thursday <laughs> or Friday. I will join on on my phone uh, on the t yeah. So we could we could be core it to keep going. Um, Councillor Petrie, Gwyneth. Yeah, um, and and you would be core it. I think I would just um, while I understand it's difficult to manage diaries etc. I just have some concerns that going past five o'clock limits, um, parents in particular. And I would just like it noted because there's a paper at the end of the agenda which is linked to our ward, obviously, and it means that I'm not going to be able to take part in that. Um, so mm -hmm. I think. It, there's not much we can do, but I would just put my concerns on record about us going past five o'clock because it makes it impossible. I could come back with James. I don't think me working with a little one in the background is is um, particularly suitable for decision making. And we have some some important papers before us, so I think it's a real shame if we go through those um, without us all being able to be there. Do you know? Yeah, I was just saying if if members choose to go beyond five o'clock, then we could rearrange the order of the. Obviously, the items that are still left, um, if that would help any members who we can't, you know, remain beyond that time. Can I suggest then that um, what we do is um, we take a, um, a short break now. We then go into private session and hear the Act 2 paper and then um, work through from there and then as long as we've still got three people left standing we're all right but I think Councillor Petrie is quite keen to speak to the Act 2 paper so does that sound suitable for people so yeah, yeah and I will I will I will I will like be following the meeting on my phone on okay well, well we just just just, just just come in when you can so if we Stop now, literally for five minutes, which takes us to 27 minutes past, and then we go into private session. So, Kirsty, if you could please stop recording, and then we'll restart after the Act 2 paper. Yeah? Okay. <laughs> 